Okay, this video is going to talk about section 13 in Hartshorn's textbook, specifically looking at the real Cartesian plane. So just as a heads up, we do have a handout for this section that lists all the key points, and it is this guy. It is posted already up on the canvas. It has the definition of what it means to be a Cartesian plane or a real Cartesian plane. It gives the two main facts that we care about. It lists out what standard form is. Again, key thing that we're going to care about. And then it goes ahead and gives you a list of some of the common trig identities that we're going to need for the rest of the course. Okay. So just as a heads up, this is the stuff that you will talk about in section 13. You've got it all on one sheet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. And the first thing is, what is this real Cartesian plane? And what it is, is it's a Cartesian plane, and it's over the set of real numbers. Now, you guys have all dealt with a real Cartesian plane before. This is literally the XY coordinate plane using real numbers. Okay, so here are the details. The points for this geometry are going to be ordered pairs, where the X and the Y coordinate are both real numbers. Lines are given by the format AX plus BY plus C equals zero. A, B, and C all have to be real numbers, but you can't have both the coefficients of A and B here being zero at the same time. Why? Because then it means constant C equals zero, and that's only true when C does actually equal zero. So, not a line. Um, betweenness is defined the same way we've defined betweenness in the past. You've got three different points that are on one line, and as long as the x-coordinates form some inequality with the x-coordinate from point B in the middle, or they follow some sort of inequality, and it looks like there is a typo here, y-coordinates um, here. So that should have been a 2. Y coordinates also have an inequality where the Y coordinate of point B is in the middle. Okay. We also have congruence for angles. This one here is defined where two angles are congruent exactly when their tangent is congruent. And in this model, this is exactly the same as if you were dealing with degrees and the degrees of the angles were the same. We have that formula that we talked about previously that was a fraction and you took the slopes of the rays of your angle and compared them in a special way or put them into the formula in a certain way. We also have congruence for line segments. So line segments are defined to be congruent if their distance formula is exactly congruent. And in a Cartesian plane, your distance formula here, or the Cartesian plane over R, your distance formula is defined right here with standard distance. So notice down to this point right here, our Cartesian plane over R is exactly the same as our standard model over R. Okay, so that all of this part right here is just the standard model over R. Now, here's the extra part that you get for a Cartesian plane. Not that we haven't been doing it yet, but the extra bits we're going to get is with parallel lines. So parallel lines are defined as two lines. They can be the same line, but if they're different lines, their slope is going to be the same. No, that's still true if they're the same line too. Okay. And perpendicular lines are defined as two lines. These guys have to be properly two different lines where their slopes are the negative reciprocals of each other. Please note here, special case, when you have vertical lines. If you have two vertical lines, they are considered parallel. And if you have a vertical line, its perpendicular line is a horizontal line and vice versa for perpendicular lines. So vertical and horizontal lines are perpendicular to each other. This here works in all the other cases where you're not dealing with a vertical line. Now, here's the part that we've totally used before, but technically we shouldn't have in our past sections. So new things with Cartesian plane is we have an x-axis, and that's the line y equals 0. We have a y-axis, that's the line x equals 0, your normal x and y axes. You have an origin point, so the origin is 0, 0. And you also have something known as unit points, and unit here refers to the number 1. So 1, 0, and 0, 1, in other words, where the number 1 lives on your x-axis and your y-axis. Now, what I'm about to tell you is totally a lie, but it gives you the right impression. You can totally think of unit points as setting the scale for your model. In other words, you could think of it as like throwing inches or feet or meters into um, the problem or onto the numbers that are on your axes. 
Again, that's not actually what it means, but it gives you the sort of right impression of how we'll use these guys in the future. Okay. And then the last thing we have are circles. And since we are in the standard model with some extra stuff, namely the Cartesian plane information thrown on, circles are given by the following equation. And notice when we talked about circles in the standard model, we got that exact same equation before, where the HK point is your center of your circle, and R is the length or the distance of the line segment that is your radius, or any line segment that is your radius of your circle. Okay, And that right there is, oh, typo. Make sure that's squared. And that's the crash course in the real Cartesian plane. So please note, what the key thing is, real Cartesian plane is simply your standard model that we've had previously, but throw in all of the stuff from high school algebra that we know happens in the XY coordinate plane. So Aki, axes, parallel, perpendicular lines, circles. Note what we don't have yet, we don't have other types of curves that, like what we would have in algebra or calculus, such as parabolas, etc. Right now we're only focused on the straight lines and the circles in terms of curves. Alright, so that's our crash course. Next thing is some details, and we're going to jump actually to the very first proposition in this section. And the first proposition in this section, I'm trying to get it right before we get to that next title. The first proposition in this section is Theorem 13.2. It is contributed to Descartes. Please don't call this Descartes' theorem. Descartes contributed lots to mathematics. It makes no sense if you say that. Okay. So Theorem 13.2 in your book. So second fact in Section 13. So what this does is it talks about or it essentially describes or explains what constructible numbers are. Okay, so let's go through the theorem and then I'll write down what this thing called a constructible number is. So this says, suppose you're given a bunch of points, n points, so point 1, point 2, point n, and they're in your real Cartesian plane. And we are assuming here that we already know our unit points and our origin. You actually only need one of the unit points in the origin. Then it turns out, according to this theorem, it's going to be possible to construct. And when we say construct here, we do mean going back to constructing with a straight edge and compass. So this is going back to those classical constructions that we did when we were only looking at Euclid's elements. Okay. So it's possible to construct the point Q given by these two new coordinates, alpha and beta, if and only if the numbers alpha and beta from your coordinates can be computed from all of the coordinates from the first n points. So the a through n, the x coordinates, and the b through n, the y coordinates. And here's the key thing, using only your operations plus minus multiplication and division. Notice those are your field operations. I lie. They will turn out to be field operations. We haven't talked about fields yet, so hold on that, that for a second. So basic operations, and the extra operation right here is taking a square root. Okay. So you've only got five things that you can do. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, and take any square root you want to. Notice you cannot take a third root here. Fourth root you could actually get around by taking a square root twice. Okay. So that would be the idea. Now. I mentioned constructible numbers before. It turns out, and let me do a side comment here. So note that new coordinate alpha and also beta are considered constructible numbers. Now, why are they considered constructible numbers? Because you are able to construct them by way of a straight edge and compass. Note, in order to get a constructible number, it does actually have to be either the x or the y coordinate of some point you've actually constructed. All right, so that's the background. Now, let's look at a couple of examples. Or when I say a couple, how about one? So suppose you have the following points, and I'm not going to do a ton of points. Suppose we say point 1 equals 2, 1. Suppose we have a second point, and this point would be negative 4, 5. And let's stop with a third point. How about third point P3 equals 0, 7. Okay. Now, here's the question. Is... Q, the point 3, comma, 
And let's be a little crazy in the y coordinate. Square root 2 minus square root 5 all over 2 square root 7. Is this point constructible? All right. So I'm going to let you guys think about that. So pause the video right now. See if you come up with a guess. Is that point Q constructible or not, given that we already know the three points, P1, P2, and P3? Now I'm going to pause a second so you have time to pause the video, and then I'll start up and we'll talk about why it is or is not constructible. Alright, so at this point, theoretically, you have a guess on whether this point is constructible or not. But let's go ahead and tie in this example with the theorem. First thing is, I'm going to label the x and y coordinates of each of our points by an a1 and a b1 for the first point. Notice that's just labeling your x and your y coordinates. And the second point, this would be a2 and b2. And then the third point, this would be A3 and B3. Now, what did we have to do or have in order for this point Q to be constructible? We have to have both of our two uh, X and our Y coordinates to be able to be written in terms of the A's and the B's from the original three points, and only using your operations plus, minus, multiplication, division, and square roots. So here, if we label according to the proposition, 3 is the same as alpha, and beta is, well, the mess. So this is square root 2 minus square root 5 all over 2 square root 7. Now, by far, alpha here is the easiest. Okay, So think to yourself, is there a way that I can get 3 from these 6, 6 x and y coordinates up top? And the answer is yes, there's actually several ways. So I'm going to do a super lazy way. And I'm going to say, hey, just add the two coordinates from the first point. Now, suppose you want to do it some other way. Maybe you do what? Maybe you add the, two, the x coordinate from the second point to the y coordinate of the third point. And there's more ways to do it too. Okay? So note the only operation that we used here was addition. Addition is one of the five we can use, so no worries. That means this guy, alpha, totally fine. And if you were writing this up on your own, don't put the check mark there. I'm going to put the check mark there just to indicate, yes, it's okay. Okay, it works. Now, for the y coordinate of point Q, we now need to go ahead and figure out some way to rewrite this one in terms of those three A's and B's, or a grand total of seven, three A's, three B's. So from our three points. Well, I'm going to be super lazy, and I'm going to say, hey, you know what? We actually have an x-coordinate of 2. That's a1. We actually have a y-coordinate of 5. That's b2. And we totally have a y-coordinate of 7. That's b3. And 2. We actually have a 2 as well. That's a1. So what I did is I just pulled the two, twos, the five, and the seven, and replaced them with coordinates we actually had. Please note it's not always this straightforward. Sometimes you have to do a little manipulation first. Now, at this stage, we then look back at our allowed operations. Have we only done addition? Well, actually no addition. Subtraction? Yep, we did subtraction. Multiplication? Yep, they're on the bottom. Division? Yep, the whole fraction is a huge division. And square roots, yeah, we actually have three square roots. And is there any other operation in play? Nope. So that means this one here is perfectly fine. Now, technically speaking, you don't need those check marks. Instead, you would say the following, which is your conclusion. So let me go ahead and put the conclusion right here. Thus, Q is a constructible number. And this is because alpha and beta, ah, 
beta were written in terms of your points 1 through 3. So in terms of, oh no, running out of space. So A1 through B3. And only have those five operations. And that's it for constructible, for a constructible point. Notice if you only wanted a constructible number, you'd only be focusing in here on the three or the fraction with roots. So on just the alpha or the beta. Now, if you want to know if some random number is itself constructible, you would form a point to put the number you care about either in the x or the y coordinate, put the other one to be zero, make your life easy. Okay. Why zero? Because we already have the origin point, so of course we're going to be able to build zero. You do nothing. So that's constructible numbers. Now, next thing that we have is the format of what we want to put our answers in, and that would be standard form. So we'll look at what standard form of a real number is, and this one here is literally just doing a little bit of algebra manipulation. So. Here's the deal with standard form. Standard form says you take any number that you want. Well, not really any number. It's specifically, it's a number that was originally obtained from rational numbers by some finite number of the operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, or square roots. Notice this is totally a tie into our constructible numbers because these guys right here are the same operations you're allowed to use with constructible numbers. The only difference is the fact here, instead of starting with any three points you're given, we actually start with the rational numbers right here. Okay. Now, turns out your standard form is in this format, R, where R is some rational number. And A here is the expression of integers and then all of this other stuff. Note what A is not allowed to have inside of it. It's not allowed to have this division inside of it. So that means you have no fractions. Okay, so what does this really mean? What this really means is you had some expression. You made sure there was no square roots in the bottom. And then you pulled out the fractional part out front. So it's a two-step process. Make sure there's no radicals in the denominator, and then rewrite it so it's some proper fraction of integer over integer fraction, rational number, multiplied but by what was originally some multiple of the top. So let's look at some examples, and I've got a couple of examples here for us. So first example is this guy. So 1 half times 4 minus square root of... 1 plus the square root of 2. Okay, so that's the first example. Now this one here actually is in standard form. So we're all good here. So I'm going to put a little check. Yes, this guy is in standard form. So in, actually let me just write it out. So in standard form. Now why? You've got the fraction out front. There's your rational number. And inside your parentheses here, totally cool to have any integers you want. Here's the thing, no fractions allowed and no square roots on the bottom. Notice if you have no fractions allowed, you have no square roots on the bottom anyway. So you pulled your fractional part out front. Now, suppose we had actually distributed this um, one half through. Suppose we have two minus one half square root of 1 plus square root 2. Okay. This second term, still in standard form, that's totally fine. But notice now that we have two terms involved, this guy is not in standard form. Why? Because you have this fraction involved with everything else. You don't have simply some rational times things with no fractions. Okay. So, Typically what will happen is you work some sort of problem, you get back whatever expression you get back, and then we'll convert it into this standard form. Now, second example. Suppose we have this guy. So 2 minus 2 square root of 1 plus square root of 2. And the question here is, is this guy in standard form? 
And the answer is technically yes. Now, why technically is this guy in standard form? Because you could totally rewrite it as 1 times 2 minus 2 square root of 1 plus square root 2. So both of these together are totally in standard form. Although, I'm not going to lie, if I was going to start thinking about factoring, I might actually pull out a 2 there and have the 2 out front and then 1 minus the root part. Okay. But this guy right now, notice with no fractions in it whatsoever, automatically you're in standard form. If, however, you have a fraction involved, the fraction has to be factored out and you make sure there's no radicals in the denominator. Now, what about this guy? So here we've got square root 2 minus square root 5 all over 2. Now I'm going to claim that that guy is actually not in standard form. I really want to do a fourth example here, but we'll have to, I guess, put it over to the side there. So this one here is not in standard form. But can we deal with it? Sure. It's got a fraction. We'll just pull the fraction out front. So this is 1 half square root 2 minus square root 5. This one here is now standard form. It's subtle. It really is subtle. All right, so last example of these types, and I'm just going to totally pick on example number C with one adjustment. Suppose you have 2 minus square root 5 over 2 square root 7. And we see that this one is very much not in standard form right now. Why not? Two issues. One, you've got the fraction incorporated with everything else. And two, you've got this square root right here in the denominator. Both are bad. And reminder, if you want to get rid of the square root in the denominator, you do have to go ahead and do what's called rationalizing the denominator. With a single square root, you just multiply by the same square root. If you actually had something like 2 minus square root 7, uh, then you'd multiply by the conjugate, in other words, the same expression you're given, but swap the plus or minus with the opposite one. Okay. So when we go ahead and multiply this out, what happens? I'm going to be lazy on the top. On the top, we simply have square root 2 minus square root 5 all multiplied by square root 7. If you want to multiply that out, you can, but you don't have to. On the bottom, or the denominator here, what happens? We now get this square root 7 times square root 7, so we get that times 2, which is 14. So pull this now into standard form, and you have the 1 over 14 out front. And then we have all of the expression with the square roots being multiplied by your 1 over 14. Okay. Now at the bottom here, that's the first time that we are in standard form both of the other two situations not in standard form. And that's it. That's all standard form is. Now, fair notice, standard form is not unique. These guys, eh, most of them were relatively unique, but you see a case of it right here. That's standard form, but you also could have factored out a 2. So it does depend on what you want to pull out, how you want to factor it, and sometimes how you actually rationalize it if they're more complicated than these examples. So that's standard form. So next example is a result of constructible numbers. And then we're going to get into some results with standard form. Okay. So First thing is, it turns out that we are going to be able to construct a line segment that has a length of square root of a, where you pick a to be some positive real number. Okay. Now, are there multiple ways of doing this? Yes, definitely. One of the ways of doing this is using Pythagorean theorem, and you build a bunch of little triangles. Okay. But this is a classic way that you might not think of right off the top of your head. Okay. So the first thing that you do is you would plot the points. I'm going to call it point A, and this is going to be where you find your positive real number R on the positive side of the x-axis. So this is our point A right down here. Then we're also going to plot this second point, which is we're going to find where negative 1 is on the x-axis. 
So we're going to plot that second point right here. Okay. And please note that while I can't show you this being done by a straight edge and compass, because I don't have a camera so you can see my hands, um, what you would actually be doing here is you'd be plotting these with your straight edge and compass. Okay. But these would be ones you'd actually find in your Cartesian plane or your real Cartesian plane. Then you would use your straight edge and compass and find your midpoint. Now, let's not lie here. If we actually have this as negative 1 and maybe this is, I don't know, like a 5, if you have 1 unit and then you have 5 units, we know that this point here is going to be 3 units away from each of them. And if you have all the little notch marks on the x-axis, you can just go directly to 3 units in. So what would that be? A 2. Okay. But typically, in terms of making everything perfectly, precisely accurate, and especially if A here is not an odd integer, you're going to want to do a proper construction with your straight edge and compass, do the little arcs, find where they intersect. Please note, this particular real Cartesian plane is where we've put algebra onto the geometry that Euclid did, so we are going back to the tools of the actual compass and the straight edge. So, how, so you go ahead and you find your midpoint. We're going to call it M. It's on the x-axis, so technically that point is M, comma, 0. Then what we're going to do is we're going to draw a circle. I'm only going to draw the, I've only drawn here for us the upper half of the circle or the upper semicircle. Um, you can also draw the complete circle, and if you draw the complete circle, um, I'll tell you what happens there uh, later on. Now, the center of the circle needs to be here at our midpoint. The radius needs to be the halfway mark, so between m and a, or between m and negative 1. And those should be the exact same numbers as just which formula you want to use. Okay. Then, the intersection of this upper semicircle and the positive x-axis right here is going to be the point, well, 0 because it's on the not x-axis, y-axis, 0 because it's on the y-axis, and then the y-coordinate is going to turn out to be the square root of whatever your a was. Okay. If you drew the full circle, where the circle intersects the negative y-axis down here would still have an x-coordinate of 0, but the y-coordinate would then be minus square root a. Okay. So you, you know how when you take the square root of a number you get plus or minus? Well, the positive root goes up for that intersection, the negative root would be the intersection below the x-axis. Okay, So let's see why this actually works. So why it works. And I'm just going to do the algebra. I'm not going to put this into any sort of formal proof. So if you wanted to put this into a formal proof, this would have to be cleaned up a little bit. This is just the algebra involved. So first thing is looking at our circle. So we know for this circle that its center is down there at m. So that's m comma 0 is the actual point. And we also know that the length of the radius, and I'm just going to abbreviate here with radius, is going to be either m minus negative 1, so m plus 1, or it's going to be a minus m. Okay. Both of them will give you the same result, but we have two different equations right now. This then tells us that we can build the equation for the circle, and we saw just a little bit ago that the equation for a circle was x minus the x-coordinate of the center plus y minus the y-coordinate of the center equals the length of your radius squared. So let's go ahead and plug in. So we'll get x minus the x-coordinate of the center, quantity squared, we'll have y minus the y-coordinate of the center, quantity squared. And then for r, we get to pick. We can either pick m plus 1 or a minus m. Either one, totally fine to do. So up to you. I'll go ahead and do the first one just because I wrote it first. So m plus 1, quantity squared. So now we'll go ahead and do a little bit of simplification. And these arrows here are just indicating where we plugged in. Okay. So if we multiply out, we'll have x squared minus 2mx plus m squared. When we multiply out the term with a y, it's just going to be y squared. And on the far side, when we just multiply out or FOIL out m plus 1 quantity squared, we'll have m squared plus 2m plus 1. 
please note things definitely cancel and simplify. So we're going to go ahead and simplify this guy. The m squareds cancel. And I'm actually going to go ahead and just write x squared plus y squared on the one side and move the 2mx to the other side. Um, if you deal with circles a lot, and I'm not assuming that you guys necessarily have or not, but when you're dealing with circles whose center is not the origin, it is standard practice to go ahead and write x squared plus y squared by itself and then put the things that came from the middle terms on the other side. So you'll often get an x squared plus y squared equals, and then you'll have a term maybe with an x, a term maybe with a y, here we're missing that one, and then plus some constant. The 2m plus 1 for us is, would be just like plus a 2 once we knew what m was. Now, we want the intersection of this circle and the positive y-axis. So, if we are looking at this circle only on the positive y-axis, this means a couple of things. First thing it means is that x equals 0, and the second thing it means is that y is going to be positive. And if you want to say greater than or equal to 0, you can totally do that too. The circle is not going to intersect um, the origin, so it's immaterial whether you put the greater than or equal to or just the greater than symbol. So let's plug in. Everywhere there's an x, we're going to go ahead and put in a 0, so both the terms with x's completely disappear. So this will simplify to y squared equals 2m plus 1. Now, I don't want to take the square root of that because we're looking for the square root of a. So, we got to figure out what this thing actually equals. So let's do a little bit of a side note. So, recall, when we had our radius, our radius could have equaled m plus 1, or it could have equaled a minus m. So, maybe it would have been smarter to plug in a minus m instead of m plus 1. I'm not going to go back and change it. Okay. So here, what would we do? Well, I've got 2m plus 1, so let's see if we can't figure out what 2m plus 1 is. Well, if we look down at this expression right here, we notice we have 1m plus 1, so we need to add an extra m to both sides. And if we add an extra m to both sides, the m completely disappears from that right-hand side, which means what? It tells you that, hey, that 2m plus 1 well, that really was just a once we replace. Okay. So that's the relation that we pulled. Now, once you go ahead and have that y squared equals a, remember a is a positive number, so we can totally take the square root of it, and we're only going to grab the positive square root because, recall, y was supposed to be bigger than 0, so that means you only get that positive root. Now, what were we actually solving for here? That's the y-coordinate of the intersection of your circle and the positive y-axis. So that tells us, yeah, that intersection right there, totally going to give you the square root you wanted. Okay? So that's the new way of constructing a square root. Notice this here is actually the exact same thing that we did previously when we were looking at um, the construction back in classical geometry of the golden triangle. One of the things that we had to do was create an expression that included a square root of 5. We did circles an appropriate spot for this same exact reason. Or I guess I should say there's some other places that we've done this as well. There's another place to say that. All right, so next application, and this one here is quite honestly an application that we're going to see quite frequently as well. And remember, theorem 13.2 was talking about how to construct a point. Well, this one here now talks about not just a point, but how would you construct an angle, okay? So if an angle is considered constructible, then it's trig functions, and specifically we're talking about sine and cosine and tangent. If you want, you can talk about the other more advanced ones, secant, cosecant, cotangent as well. Those guys can be expressed simply using square roots. Okay? Now, this is not true of all trig functions and all angles, but as soon as you get a constructible angle, that's when you're going to be able to rewrite your trig functions in terms of your square roots. Okay, And we're going to have some examples of that here in just a second. But first, a side note, what do we mean by a constructible angle? So angle 
In just a second, let me get those bubbles out of the way. Angle A, or really angle alpha here, is constructible. If you can do the following, and I'm just going to do a little picture or demo, looking at, say, the first quadrant. If you can find a point Q, and Q is constructible, then the angle formed by the ray that contains both Q and the origin, and the ray here along the x-axis, and technically you could do the one along the y-axis as well, would form your constructible angle alpha. In other words, what do you have to have? You have to have your point where the two rays come into play. And typically we just copy the angle down at the origin here. Have one of the rays known, so you have no points on the one ray. So if you grab an axis, you know that line already. And here, as long as you can find a point on this second ray, and that point, here's the key, that point Q itself is constructible. And that's what we mean when we say constructible angle. Now, let's look at some examples of this. One of the things you may or may not have seen previously in a trig course, what's known as reference triangles. If you've heard this name before, awesome. If you haven't heard this name before, don't worry about it. I'm about to show you what they are. There's two reference triangles. One is the 45, 45, 90 degree triangle. Okay, your right angle your 45 degrees, your 45 degrees. And this guy here, the reference triangle, would be specifically giving you your ratios. So the two legs are both length 1, and then the hypotenuse has a length of square root 2. Note it's isosceles due to your two angles there being 45 degrees, which means you can change out the length here from 1 to anything you want, but it has to match. And using Pythagorean theorem, you can find that hypotenuse. Now, the other reference triangle is the 30, 60, 90 degree triangle. So that little skinny thing is trying to be 30 degrees. The larger angle up there is trying to be 60 degrees. And the references here is the smaller side is opposite the 30 degree angle. has a reference of 1. The hypotenuse, a reference length of 2. And you can solve for your third length of the third, third sky starting over can solve for the length of your third side using the Pythagorean theorem and it turns out to be square root 3. Okay. Now, when we actually look over these, let's look at sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay. So if we start off with our reference triangle, that's the 45, 45, 90 degrees. If we look at sine of 45 degrees, well you do have to remember that sine is for 45 degrees opposite over hypotenuse, so this is 1 over square root 2. Now, standard form. We want to put this, we want to have everything we write in this section and in the future in standard form. So you want to go ahead and convert to standard form. We multiply top and bottom by square root of 2. Still not standard form. You pull the 1 half out front, and 1 half root 2 would then be the standard form for sine of 45 in terms of square roots, not the decimal your calculator gives you back. Now, for cosine of 45 degrees, you actually get the exact same thing. Remember, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's still 1 over square root 2. Everything, all the other work above, stays the same, so you would still get in standard form that this guy is 1 half root 2. And if you wanted to deal with tangent of 45, this is opposite over adjacent. In other words, 1 over 1 or 1, and that already is in standard form because there's no fractions or square roots. Okay. Fractions and square roots are the only thing that requires you to convert something if you're in standard form or if you're trying to get to, to standard form. Now, if we look over here to our reference triangle, we can do the exact same thing if we're dealing with sine and cosine of, say, 30 degrees. So if we look at sine of 30 degrees. That would be opposite over hypotenuse, so 1 half. That's already in standard form, 
so no change necessary. If we then look at cosine of 30 degrees, that's adjacent to square root 3 over 2. That's not quite standard form, but there's almost no work to convert. Just pull the 1 half out front, so 1 half root 3 would be standard form. And we could totally look at tangent as well. If we looked at tangent of 30 degrees, this guy would be what? This would be opposite over adjacent, so 1 over square root 3. That one properly needs a little bit of conversion, so multiply top and bottom by square root 3. And then pull the fraction out front, so this would be 1 third root 3. Now, unlike with the 45, 45, 90 degree triangle, the only angles involved were 90, which we're not going to bother with right now, and 45 degrees. Here in our 30, 60, 90 degree triangle, we have both 30 degrees and 60 degrees. So, if we look at sine of 60 degrees, it would be square root 3 over 2. In other words, sine of 60 degrees is the same as cosine of 30 degrees. And cosine of 60 degrees is adjacent over opposite, so that's 1 over 2. So cosine of 60 is the same as sine of 30. Now, the only part that changes up a little bit is if you're doing tangent. Tangent here is going to be opposite over adjacent. So if we look at tangent of 60, it will totally be the reciprocal of the tangent of 30 degrees. In other words, it would just be square root 3, and square root 3 is already in standard form. Okay, So that would be dealing with triangles, and this really is the big thing that we look at in section 13, is dealing with triangles and then doing trig manipulation. Now, in terms of what I'm going to expect you to know, I expect that you know the standards. And when I say the standards, that's sine, cosine, tangent of 45 degrees, 30 degrees, 60 degrees. And I'm also assuming you know it for zero degrees, which technically speaking you should never have in this course, or 90 degrees your right angles. Okay. Now, one of the things that we are going to need is we are also going to need some trig just because it'll help you when we start getting more complicated triangles or more complicated angles that we want to find the sine or cosine of those more complicated angles. And so some ident trig identities help, ver help here. I am assuming that you know the top one there. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Please note the theta. The angles here have to match. The rest of these guys of your double or half angle identities, depending how they're written, you call them two different things, or your sum and difference identities, or your law of sines, law of cosines. These guys, I'm expecting that, I'm assuming that you've seen before, but not necessarily that you have them memorized, which is why I went ahead and gave you the list of all of these common trig identities. Are there more? Oh, yes. And if you want to look up more trig identities to use on future things, that's totally fine. But these are the only ones that you would actually need. And quite frankly, the top three and the bottom two are the ones that we use most frequently. These four in the middle, um, I don't think I've ever actually given a question where you had to use them. Although many of the questions, you can use these guys just fine as well. All right. So that's all of the background. The next thing that we have is a properly new concept. Okay. And this is proposition 13.3. 13.3 is the last proposition that we're going to look at in this section. I believe it actually is the last proposition in this section. So what this says is you've got a circle. The circle has radius 1, so let me go ahead and mark that right here. Okay, And you know that the length of the chord AB on the circle has a length of D. Okay. Now, this one here, this chord AB is supposed to subtend the angle that we're going to call alpha. That angle is exactly the same as in its three-letter name. A, O, B. In other words, O is the center of the circle right here. Okay? And D is the, if you will, base of the formed isosceles triangle. Now, according to this proposition, the claim is that the length of this chord D is given by the formula square root of 2 minus 2 cosine of alpha, whatever alpha is right there. Now, not going to lie, just as a heads up, or a note right here. So note. 
the way that this triangle is formed, the only way it's going to work to be inscribed in a circle like this, you are going to have to have your alpha in terms of degrees. It has to be larger than zero and it also has to be less than 180 degrees. Okay, so just as a heads up there, don't overthink where this alpha is going to be into play. Now the question of course is why in the world do we get the formula that we get? And it turns out this is just a straight up application of our trig identity of the law of sines. I lie. Law of cosines. Now to remind ourselves, I'm going to give us a little reference triangle over here. Law of cosines, while it's always typed up in terms of A's and B's and C's, this is what it would look like in a reference triangle. And this is just an arbitrary triangle. I'm trying to get the lines to be relative decides to be relatively straight lines even though I'm freehanding it. So that last one missed there a little bit. So suppose this guy is, I don't know, maybe B. This guy here is A. This guy here is C. So remember, vertices of triangles are points. Points are denoted by capital letters. Now here's the thing that we haven't talked about too much. Sides of triangles, specifically the lengths of sides of triangles, are always denoted by lowercase letters. And you pick the letter that is opposite the vertex in the triangle. So side BC has a length of lowercase a, side AB has a length of lowercase c, and side AC has a length of lowercase b. Notice it's the one letter in the triangle that didn't come from the name of the side. Okay? And that little a, b, and c um, right here on your sides of your triangle indicates the length of the side of the triangle. So this tells you if you're looking at this guy right here, so length of AB or C, that length of AB, it's going to be A squared plus B squared. Well, there's no guarantee that you actually have a right angle here at angle C. So then you say, well, I'm going to subtract 2 times AB times cosine of whatever that angle here is at C. Okay. Now, let's relate the triangle we actually have to this reference triangle. So we want to compute the length d. So in our case, our c in the formula is really going to turn into our length, our d in the picture. So this is the reference, and this is what we actually care about. So this is proposition 13.3 info. Okay. Now a and b, both of them, are going to equal 1. Why? Because they're the other two sides. Okay. Angle C in the reference is exactly going to correspond to our angle alpha in the proposition we care about. So let's put it all together. This tells you that C squared, or the length of the chord that we care about, D squared, is equal to A squared plus B squared. So that's 1 squared plus 1 squared, minus 2 times A times B, A and B were both 1, cosine of alpha, the angle we care about here being alpha. Okay. Now, simplify and notice what happens. This tells you that D squared is exactly the same as 2 minus 2 cosine alpha, or if you want regular old D, this is simply going to be the positive root 2 minus 2 cosine of alpha. Why the positive root? Take a moment, think about why the positive root. It's because D here represents the length of that chord AB, so D needs to be a positive real number. Okay. So this guy is literally just an application of law of cosines. All right, so let's put all this together and we'll end on a last example. And this example is we want to find the length of the side of a regular decagon that is inscribed in a circle with radius 1. Now, circle of radius 1 is a really big giveaway that says we we're going to want to use our proposition 13.3 potentially. But the other big thing that we need is the fact that this is a regular decagon. So this picture is not going to look nice because I'm freehanding a circle. 
Hey, that's not too bad. So you've got some center, and then you've got a decagon has what? Deca here is telling you that you have 10 sides. The regular tells you that they are all, the vertices will all be equally spaced along your circle. Ooh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I did not get to it, so we're going to put a dot dot here. Those guys were not well spaced. So say you take one of the triangles. Maybe here this is A, maybe here this is B. So we'll make those circles a little bit bigger. We know we have a side for our decagon, which should be the chord AB, and then all of the other guys. If we go ahead and form the isosceles triangle from the center to one of the sides of the decagon, what will we have? Well, we know the circle has radius 1. So the length of the two radii, i.e. the length of line segment AO and BO, will both be 1. And I'm going to go ahead and label the length of AB with a lowercase d. That's the length we don't know and we want to find. Okay. Now, if we go ahead and we use proposition, so use proposition 13.3, this tells us that that length of that chord D is the square root of 2 minus 2 cosine alpha. Now, alpha was that central angle, so we do have to go ahead and compute alpha. Well, that's not too terrible. If we go ahead and compute alpha, that's simply going to be, well, it could be a couple of different things, but what do we know? We've got 360 degrees around the circle. We've got 10 sides, so there's 10 of these guys that we have. It's regular, so everybody is congruent in terms of its sides and its angles. So we're just going to divide by 10. In other words, alpha is 36 degrees. So this tells us that our D, our length of our side, is the positive root 2 minus 2 cosine of 36 degrees. Wow, don't do that last one. No zero. 36 degrees, and if we were just going to plug it into a calculator and get back a decimal answer, we would be done right now. Now, here's the extra thing. Suppose we actually need this in standard form, okay? So that is, technically speaking, we have an answer there almost, but it would only be in decimal. So suppose here we got, we want in standard form form. Okay. So it turns out there is a trick. Okay. And the trick here is I'm going to focus in on this little itty bitty isosceles triangle that we drew up here in scratch work and I'm going to blow it up for us. Hmm. Let me reorder this just a second so we have a better location for the larger isosceles picture. So I'm going to go ahead and put the line up a little bit taller there. And we'll add on, find the length of the side inscribed here. I'm going to add the directions up at the top. So in standard form. All right. So if we go ahead and we write out our large isosceles triangle, I'm going to put it over here to the side where there's a little more space. Again, no guarantees that this is an awesome isosceles triangle. I'm only freehanding it. So pretend that's an isosceles triangle. So down here, we've got point B, we've got point A, and we've got the center O. So that's that same isosceles triangle from the itty bitty picture. We know the length from B to O is one. We know the length from A to O is also one, but I'm gonna wait on actually drawing that in because we're gonna do something in just a second. Okay. We also know the angle at the top here is alpha or 36 degrees. And the question of course is could we actually find our angles down here, angle at B and angle at A? And the answer is yes, we totally can. So if those base angles, we typically call them beta, are going to be what? Well, 180 degrees minus 36 degrees divided by 2 because there's two of them and that turns out to be 72 degrees.
Yeah. And both of them are 72 degrees. Now notice, this one here, there's something special about it. You can't do this in every situation. But the thing that's special here is our base angles are exactly double that top angle. Which means we can bisect here the angle at B. And when we bisect that angle at B, we'll get 36 degrees for each of the new two angles. And I'm going to go ahead and put a point in there and let's call that point D. Now, what's nice about the newly formed triangle OBD? Well, you've got two angles that are the same. That tells us we have what? That tells us we actually have doop, 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 two angles. The opposite angles are congruent. This is a proposition that we had back in Euclid's Elements that said, hey, um, two angles are the same. You really have a nice isosceles triangle. Now, second thing you have if we look at the angle D, you can actually find the two degrees. The one we don't really care about is the one in triangle OBD. That one actually turns out to be 108. So 180 minus 72. But what does that mean? That tells you that the other angle at D is 72 degrees. Now what's nice about getting a 72 degrees right here? Well, when you look in the little triangle at ABD, we have two of the angles are 72 degrees, which means we have an isosceles triangle, or side AB is congruent to side BD. Notice where those hatch marks are. Those hatch marks travel from the base of the original largest isosceles triangle up to part of its side, which means AB is con has a length of D, BD that we don't care about has a length of D, and OD also has a length of D. And I'll go ahead and put in a little D right there, even though right now we don't need it. I guess technically we'll need it in just a second. So, missing side. We want the length of A to D, or we're going to need the length A to D. Remember, O to A was a length of 1. O to D is a length of D. So the total is 1, part of it's D. That means this remaining part has a length of whatever 1 minus D is. Now, here's what we're about to jump into. We're about to jump into needing to use a fact with similar triangles. So, similar triangles. Now, specifically here, I am going to claim that the largest triangle, OAB, is similar to that smallest triangle, B, D, A. Make sure I get the letters right. Notice the symbol for similar triangles. It looks like the similar symbol for congruent triangles, except there's no equals on the bottom. That's totally by design because similar triangles do include the subset of all congruent triangles, but they also include triangles like what we just have, that only the angles are congruent to each other but the actual size of the triangles are two different sizes. In other words, one's a scaled version of the other. Now, I'm going to go ahead and pull out something that we know back from high school geometry. When we have similar triangles, we can put it into a ratio. So if we look at our big triangle, OAB, if we look at its side, the length of the side of OAB is 1. And then we can look at its base. And the length of the base is the thing we don't know, that D. If we then, so that was side, base. If we then look at the little tri isosceles triangle that's similar to the big one, we have its side, its side is D, or length D, and its base has a length of 1 minus D. Notice we now have an equation that only has the unknown D, that length of that core that we were trying to find. So what are we going to do? We are totally going to now use algebra and solve this. Please note what I am doing here is using algebra just like you would have back in a high school geometry class. We're not being super formal here. We didn't throw this into a proof format at all. 
okay? And in this section, other than making sure you cite what propositions you use, like what we did right here of Proposition 13.3, this here is very much a throwback to what you could have seen in high school. Other than standard form, that may or may not have been talked about in high school. So we'll go ahead and do a little bit of algebra, and a little bit of algebra is, actually, let me pull us down to right here. So our little bit of algebra is, we will mult cross multiply, so we'll have d squared equals 1 times 1 minus d, or d squared equals 1 minus d. So we put that all together, don't overthink it. So this would be d squared plus d minus 1 equals 0. We'll go ahead and use our quadratic equation. And if we use our quadratic equation, reminder, this is negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So when we plug this in, we'll get negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 1. I was trying to be a parenthesis, all over 2 times 1. And when you simplify this thing, it is negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 all over 2. Now, fun fact, while we got two answers, there's not really two answers. Only one of those guys will work. So this tells us that D cannot be have the negative here in front of the root, otherwise it would be a negative number. So this means that d is negative 1 plus the square root of 5 all over 2. And if we wanted that in standard form, that's the same as 1 half times negative 1 plus square root 5. Or if you hate that negative 1, this is totally the same as negative 1 half 1 minus square root 5. Notice that's two different ways of writing standard form. Okay. Now, that gets you to the answer that we were asked to find, which was simply, let me blow this up a little bit, which was simply, what is the length of the side for our regular decagon, our regular 10-sided figure? Okay. So D was the length of that side. We just found the answer. Um, I'm missing one line off the bottom, so the positive version here was the answer. Okay. Again, standard form, no decimals. We want precision, not some truncated decimal. Now, I'm going to say that that's a part A. Let's look at an associated problem. And suppose your associated problem is as follows. Let me scroll down here. So B, find cosine of 36 degrees in standard form. In other words, we don't want the decimal. We don't want the thing that your calculator is going to give back to you. We want the actual computed um, standard form. So radicals, fractions as needed. Now, here's the interesting part. We knew that the length of our chord AB was given by this formula, square root 2 minus 2 cosine of 36 degrees. And we just found that this guy right here, or D, equaled 1 half times negative 1 plus square root 5. What does that tell you? That tells you you can totally solve for it. okay? Or you can solve for a cosine of 36. So let's go ahead and blow this up a little bit so it's easier to see, and we'll set these two things equal to each other. So a reminder, d equal the square root of 2 minus 2 cosine of 36 degrees. Okay. So we can put this, plug this in. If we have 1 half of negative 1 plus square root 5 equals the square root of 2 minus 2 cosine 36, We'll go ahead and solve both sides, or we'll try to solve both sides for cosine of 36. So square both sides. So this will be 2 minus 2 cosine of 36 degrees. The other side, when we square it, we'll have 1 fourth. And when we square the bits in the middle, what will happen? We'll actually get here, where is that squared? That squared would be positive 1. These two multiplied together, so negative 2 square root 5 
and that squared would be plus 5. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and combine terms together, and I'm going to multiply both sides by 4 just to get rid of the fraction. Okay. So when we combine like terms together, this is 6 minus 2 root 5. On the other side, if we multiply by 4, we'll have 8 minus 8 cosine of 36. So we subtract 8 from both sides, so here's negative 2, negative 2 root 5, all equals negative 8 cosine. So the negatives are going to cancel on both sides, and when we divide by 8, we're actually going to get 1 fourth times 1 plus square root of 5. And that would be our standard form for cosine of 36 degrees. It turns out you can do associated stuff too. Okay? So maybe you do a part C and somebody asked you to find uh, cosine, I should say cosine, sine of 36 degrees. So here's where you look at some trig function that relates sines of, and cosines together. I prefer this one, which is sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. I think that's a really nice guy to deal with. So what would that be? This would tell you that sine of 36 degrees totally equals 1 minus cosine squared of 36 degrees. And then you took the square root here. Okay. And then at this point, you just plug in that expression. Okay. So if you plugged in that expression, this would be the square root of 1 minus, ah, that needed to be a 1. Wait a second. 1 over 4 squared is 16. And this would be 1 plus 2 root 5 plus 5. Now, this guy is not in standard form, so you would have to clean it up a little bit. Good news, bad news, some of this stuff cleans up very nicely. So, if we go ahead and simplify this, this would be square root 1 minus, what is that, 6 plus 2 root 5 all over 16. I'm going to go ahead and keep the 16, so combine it into a single fraction on the inside. So you have 16 minus 6 minus 2 root 5. Remember the negative there distributes through on both pieces all over 16. Now why did I put it all over the same fraction? Because you can't have fractions inside of your radicals. Remember standard form, the fractions have to be pulled out. So I'm going to pull out this fraction. The 1 over 16 can be pulled out into a 1 over 4. And that leaves us with just the stuff on the top. So that would be 10 minus 2 root 5. Okay. That now is in standard form. And you could also do something like, and this will be the last thing that we talk about, you could also ask something like, hey, find, oh, I don't know, how about cosine of 18 degrees? Well, cosine of 18 degrees, here's where you would actually need to pull out another trig identity. And the trig identity that you'd want to pull out is one of your double angle identities. Notice, so note, here that 18 is half of 36, or if you prefer, 2 times 18 equals 36. So what that means is cosine, and this is specifically cosine squared of 18, is exactly the same as 1 plus cosine of 2 times 18. I'm going to let you guys go find the trig identity I just used there. Here, the alpha is 18 in the formula. Okay. So this is simply 1 plus cosine of 36. We already have cosine of 36, so you just drop it in. So this would be 1 plus 1 fourth of 1 plus square root 5 all over Again, this is where you'd need to deal with that one-fourth. So if you deal with that one-fourth, it drops to the bottom. And what's the best way? Multiply really by 4 across the top and multiply by 4 across the bottom. So this would be 4 plus 1 plus square root 5 on the top. And on the bottom, you'd have 8. Okay. Now, to finish this off, 
If you want regular old cosine of 18, this would be your 5 plus square root 5 on the top, 8 on the bottom. You take the square root of that. Pull out the fraction. So you'll have 1 over square root 8 times square root of 5 plus square root 5. Now square root of 8 is the same as 2 root 2. So you can either think of this as multiplying top and bottom by square root of 2, or you can think of it as multiplying top and bottom by square root of 8. Both ways will be fine. I'm going to multiply by square root of 2. So if we multiply top and bottom by square root 2, multiply the bottom by square root of 2, and you'll actually get the square root of 16, which is 4. And this is still 5 plus square root 5. Put it in standard form, and we have 4 root 2 times 5 plus square root 5. And technically speaking, that's fine to leave it like that, but normally people will multiply the 2 inside, and you'll actually get 10 plus 2 root 5 under that radical. But I just ran out of paper. I just ran out of space here to write. So actually, it's going to run off the page. You won't see it outside of what we're just saying, but you could actually write this as square root then of 10 plus 2 root 5. That won't save anywhere. Okay. But that then would be the idea of dealing with tons of different stuff. Notice a lot of this work, once we got grubbing around in the examples at the end, totally feels like a combination of trig and geometry from high school. When you're dealing with the real Cartesian plane, that's what it is. This is the same xy coordinate plane with real numbers that we've dealt with in the past. Okay. In other words, all those assumptions before we got into our college level geometry and we saw Hilbert geometry, all those assumptions, those are starting, those will be fine in the real Cartesian plane. Now, this is a preview of the stuff we're actually going to care about in this course, which is a Cartesian plane over any field, but that's section 14 in the rest of chapter 3. This was just the preview of reminding yourself what a Cartesian plane is and some of the stuff you can do with trig. But that is it on section 13. Um, going forward, we'll look at fields and Cartesian planes for our models of geometry.